The following presentation is brought to you by KMmedia.pro. Please visit KMmedia.pro for more information. Now stay right where you are as we present. Welcome to Positive Talk Radio, evolving ideas, one conversation at a time. Great guests, dynamic stories and interviews, plus new thoughts on a wide range of topics and concepts. I hope that you'll hang with me, Kevin McDonald, my friends, and of course, you, as together we work to understand why we are all here and what we can do to make our world a better place for all of us to be happy, be kind, and live in peace together. Yep, that's Positive Talk Radio. Everybody, to another episode of Positive Talk Radio. My name is Kevin McDonald, and I'm very excited to talk to the gentleman that uh, that I get to talk to today. He's he's a really cool dude, as as I think that you could say that. Um, he is a writer, an actor, a director a swordsman, a fight director, a playwright, an educator. He's also an author. He's a professional actor, stunt performer in films and television. He's and you may have you may recognize him because he's been in Scooby Doo number 2, The Supernatural, Stargate, DC's Legends of Tomorrow and the popular Air Bud franchise. And he's also written a play and that came out in 2017 and it was, it was entitled Star Wars How Star Wars Saved My Life. In which premiered in 2017, obviously. Uh, he is a has a, a master's degree and a doctorate. You've been in a lot of schooling, my friend. Uh, I, I've spent most of my life in school. <laughs> well, you've done you've done extraordinary things in your life. And uh, but I want to start with um, the book that you've written. It's called uh, A Safe Place: The True Story of Faith, Betrayal and the power of the force. We're going to talk mm -hmm. about the power of the force in a little bit, but you know, it's really timely. Uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Harrison is our guest, by the way, and you can follow along by going to his website, which is nicholasjharrison.com. And you can find out all about him. And I encourage you to do that. But uh, um, I, I, it's cool that in 77, you walked into a theater and saw Star Wars. I did, too, that, mm. at the same time. And it was it blew me away because I'd never seen that kind of uh, the stunt work and and the and the special effects. I'd never seen anything like that before. Um, and I'm 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 glad it helped you a great deal. But let's talk about your book a little bit. And it's really timely because I believe memory serves me I, I didn't read the article but but recently one of the dioceses uh made a settlement did you hear about that there's uh i mean it depends how recently you're you're talking about there's a lot of different action happening in the different dioceses um there's a lot of movement so it's so nice to actually see that there's movement happening as as opposed to the past where it would be like did you hear anything about the church so um, in terms of the latest settlement, I would have to take a look and see what exactly you're referring to. Because I know there's um, there was a case that was settled just a year and a half ago. But recently, I, if there's anything new, I'm very excited to find out more about it. Yeah, it's it. Uh, I believe that it just happened uh, this week or last week. Oh, wow. I look uh, forward to finding out more about that. Yes. And the reason that we're talking about diocese, which is, of course, the church, was you grew up in the Catholic Church. And when you were a kid um, and you were a uh, um, what are they what do they call him? They call him an acolyte. Um, I was a, I was an altar boy. Altar boy. That's 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 it. Uh, in, the, in the Lutheran Church, they call it more of an acolyte kind of thing. And in any event. But you um, suffered abuse, mm -hmm. terrible abuse at the hands of the priests. And it's, it has, uh, and I wanted to talk about that because that's the book that you've written and talks about that to a great degree. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, some of the reviews, by the way, that I've read on the book, I haven't, sadly, I haven't read the book yet. I'm going to, but, um, the reviews that I've had that the, it was highly inspirational and it wasn't, mm -hmm. it was expected to be, <clears throat> as you might expect, expected to be really dark and it's, it has its dark places to be sure, but that's not the that's not the purpose of the book. The no. book is is the 
the walk through everything that you went through and to come out as best you could on the other side. Yes, exactly. Yeah, to find the balance between the good and the bad, if you want to, to summarize it like that as well. And the good or the or the good or the dark side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> which, yeah, exactly. Which there will make a lot of Star Wars references because I for some reason it seems to me like like Lucas had it all together when he uh, uh framed it as the dark side and the force because the force was for good and the dark side was for evil. Well, the the force is what I love about the force in the concept of the force. And again, coming in, uh, having been indoctrinated with Catholicism, the force represents the, the living entity of energy that binds us, surrounds us and keeps us all together. And within the force, there's the light side and the dark side. And everyone has the light and the dark within us. And it's a matter of striving, not necessarily for all the light side or all the dark side, but striving to find the balance between the two. And, and that to me is, is a very simplistic way, but also a very kind way at looking at all religion. You know, it's like if we call it the force or we call it God or we call it um, the gods, um, what I like about the force, it's not personified. It's an energy field. It is a living entity that brings, creates, and transforms life. Like, you know, within it, there's, we call it death, but it's more like through the death, there becomes a rebirth. So it actually encompasses so many different types of aspects of religion. And I think that's just fascinating. And if you talk to people like, oh, I don't know, Einstein and Tesla and and some of the great thinkers of all time, they'll tell you that everything is just energy. Yes, and and energy energy is neither created nor destroyed. It just transfers, you know, and changes. So I I think it's uh, a much, for me, having, you know, endured abuse at the hands of the Catholic um, priests, that to find a sense of spirituality within the force is a great way to look at it because I don't look at it as this old man sitting in a chair, passing judgment or having the priest make deals with children to earn their love. So it just makes that much more sense um, to me anyway. No, it, it does to a lot of people because, you know, and especially nowadays things are seem to be lightening up and people are becoming more enlightened. And they're mm-hmm. talking more about positive energy and the force behind it and the, and the force for good. And yet you're right. It is a complete thing. And we make a conscious decision. All of us do as to how we are going to utilize that force and whether it's going to be for positive and good, or you're going to slip into what Lucas calls the dark side, mm-hmm. which is our lower and which is more based in fear and our lower um, um, energy levels than than the enlightened uh, um, uh, force of the light. Mm-hmm. And and um, it's you know, and when you were going through what you were going through, it had to appear to be everything was dark for you because it was a, a very difficult time. Well, I think, you know, the, for me, you know, cause I started school in grade four when I went to, to Catholic school and in, in kindergarten from kindergarten through grade four and <laughs> learning because I, my family wasn't Catholic. They just wanted to put me in a place where I'd get a really good education. And so I started learning all about the, you know, cause part of their whole uh, schooling was also learning about, Catholicism. So I just found myself becoming baptized and, 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 you know, uh, through their teachings. And part of it was the fear that was put into me as a non-Catholic going to a Catholic school of all these things I had to do to earn God's love. So the grooming started in kindergarten and started rather innocently, but progressed to where they could control me by through the threats of what they did to me, I could keep the secret because if I was to tell anyone, God was going to destroy my family and myself. So as a small child, having this put on you that you were basically the go-between between survival and death and you're five years old, that's a huge responsibility to 
to carry and to, you know, even in grade four, when, when I, I got out and that was just only by chance, there was a, a lucky situation that happened that got me out of the school, but still for many years after that, believing that I had to keep that secret because if I told anyone, God would, would destroy us. And, you know, you see the images and there's the stories in the Bible about a very, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Old Testament about a very vengeful God that yep. will destroy, you know? So, yeah, it, it, it seemed, again, and a lot of people will say, well, how did you believe them? Why would you believe that? Why did you tell your parents? It's like, have you ever spoken to a kid who's four or five years old and talked to them about Santa Claus or the Easter Bunny? It's real. It is real. So when you have these priests telling you all these things and they're surrounded with all the paraphernalia of their religion and they tell you this is what the situation is, you believe them as a small child. You you do. And it haunts you. And it was a it was like the worst kept, it was the worst secret I've ever had to keep or feel that I had to keep to protect my family. Well, you know, that is it's a matter of control. And it, by the way, being five years old, it, it, there are adults that are still are under that umbrella of fear that if they don't do things the right way, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be hell and damnation. And, 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 and so it happens, it, it, but being five, you have no other recourse other than to believe them. Mm-hmm. You know, and, yeah. uh, and it's so sad. It's so sad. I've always, I've always wondered why, you know, well, I know why they, why priests always are men and why priests cannot get married, mm. but uh, in the, in the Catholic church, but I don't think that's very healthy. <laughs> well, and you know, like before it was, I forget which Pope it was, um, because I'm not as up on my history of the Catholics, but you know, there was a time when priests were married and that they were, they would actually um, collect all this property and wealth for the church, but they would will it to their children. And the church didn't like that. So the Pope passed, I, I want to say Pope Pius, um, but, the, uh, but the, the Pope decided, nope, all the belongings have to go to the church. So he passed this decree that no priests were allowed to marry. So at one point they could, and it was allowed. But they didn't like seeing all this capital from the church going to their children. So they made it where priests couldn't marry and everything would go to Rome. Well, you know, it's it's kind of like, well, the Boy Scouts of America have had a similar uh, recently in, in the in in the United States have had a similar issue uh, in that. Let's, you know, let's put a bunch of boys together with men and then let's see what happens, because there are men that are pedophiles. Mm. And and they are attracted to young young men, and they're they're in that. And the same thing with the Catholic Church, because they couldn't marry. Um, a lot of the not a lot, but there were some of them that used it as a safe haven to get what they wanted to do, and and that's apparently what happened to the priests that you were working with. Right. Yeah. And that's and that that is so sad. How you doing today, by the way? Every day is a new day. So, you know, it's been many years since the abuse and it's been many years of healing. And, you know, the after effects of what happened to me, they are residual. They carry on. And um, I think, you know, it's interesting too, like part of it, and I completely understand as well why it happened. Um, Rebecca, who you know, Rebecca Harrison. Yes. Who was on the show. She was my wife. And she lived through the first time around when I first disclosed about the abuse and she was there and she put up with so much uh, of my pain and suffering. And when it came out through a, that, that I discovered that um, my case was not officially dismissed, so I could actually carry on pursuing it. And I've resurrected the case, no pun intended with resurrection, but you know, um, resurrecting the case and then also with my book and again living with an abuse survivor is hard because we are like avoidant attachment disorder type people you know it's like 
I have to control so much of how I react or how I respond to things. It can be really difficult. So Rebecca finally decided she needed to be on her own. And I completely support that. I'm like, of course, I get it because it's a lot. And she lived through it once. She doesn't need to live through it again. Um, so there's that. I mean, so that is, I, I really do credit uh, or blame uh, what happened to me for the, you know, uh, eventual dissolution of our marriage, we're still friendly and we're still friends with each other. Um, and we have two wonderful children. But again, I see that as being part of the collateral damage of how the church destroys. I'm very fortunate in that I did not succeed in suicide and that I did not succeed in um, unenlivening myself and that I was strong-willed to continue to speak out against what happened when I finally did speak out. But so many people don't. And so many people are afraid because the church is a very powerful organization, even to this day still. Um, and the first time when I had the, 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 fir the first go around with my initial lawyer, we were getting death threats people were threatening us and threatening the lives of our family. And these are people who believe themselves to be pious, you know, very Catholic people that would kill for their religion. And it was terrifying. And I was scared about that whole thing. And now this time around, I don't care because the truth is, is getting out there more and more. And it was seemed like initially what happened is my my case, no one was at the time when I first came out about it, people weren't talking about the abuse. It's something that was, you know, discussed in quiet quarters, but no one really spoke out publicly about it. And the timing was everything when my initial lawyer wanted me to withdraw my suit. Um, spotlight hadn't happened at that time. The whole spotlight scandal in Boston. And it was shortly after, you know, I thought that the case was dismissed that the huge spotlight events came out, which led to the movie spotlight. And that made, that really put um, the plight of how the Catholic uh, hierarchy dealt with victims and uh, of the abusers. And what it did is initially, you know, people were trying to discredit all the people that were coming out, but there was just too many. It was like floodgates had opened. And I decided at that point, and I remember telling my initial lawyer when she told me that we weren't going to really have any success because no one was speaking out about it and we had no other witnesses, uh, even though I had a half-sister who had been abused and she's a drug addict and, and she was like running away from home uh, all through her teenage years, I, I just decided, told my lawyer, I said, you know what, I'm going to continue speaking out about it. I'm going to continue to tell my story. And she didn't tell me not to. And... That led to, of course, the play. You know, the initially it was a paper I wrote when I was working on my doctorate, which became a play, which now has become the book, and now into the the new lawsuit. Because I really have a strong sense that judgment needs to, you know, that there, these people need to be held accountable. And I'm speaking up for the 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 five year old kid who was abused. You know, five to eight year old child. And I even told my, my lawyer when we first came out about, uh, or when we resurrected the case, and she wanted to use a, a photo of me, I said, you can use a photo of me to, to represent it. But I said, I think it will be more impactful to use the photo of me when I went to the school. So mm -hmm. when she put out the initial press release, there was the photo of me, which is also, it's actually um, in the hardcover version of the book, there's the picture of me uh and that's You're the end it was when the abuse was happening and if you look closely you see i have a black eye and you know so it's it's right there and it's all part yeah and i was a cute kid and you know i learned i grew up very fast at that age so it's it's been a you know when people say how are you doing my short answer is like oh i'm fine how are you <laughs> the long answer is you got <laughs> half an hour i'll tell you how i'm doing <laughs> and and so you know every day is is a Every day I wake up wanting to, if I can help one other person who may have, may or not have disclosed their abuse, know that they're not alone and give them the, 
the message that we can stand together, then it's a great day. And, and that's what I feel that I'm here to do. I'm here to speak out and speak up, not only for me, but for all of those who can't and won't, or who are maybe not even here to be able to do that anymore. You got death threats, death threats from um, practicing Catholics. Yes. So back in the first, the first evolution of the case. Yeah, we did. Yeah. It's, it's just, that's startling. It, it's, it's, you know, and I, I get the fact that there are people in the world that are devout, devout Catholic people and they, they buy into it hook, line and sinker. But you know, what you're doing is you're going to be helping some five-year-old kid today that parents are going to be a little bit more aware, I hope. Mm -hmm. And so that, so that they're going to not, because when I was growing up, my my grandmother was Catholic Mm -hmm. and the, the priests were held in such high esteem that they were considered, well, in the Catholic doctrine, they're considered your gateway to God. Mm Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and so consequently, they are above us. They are one step closer and in their piety and in their honesty and who they are. But they are, at the end of the day, they're just human beings and they have yeah. failings. Exactly. And, you know, they, the, the one thing about, um, like in, in Canada, we're, they're starting to uncover all these mass graves outside of different churches. And so finally, people that were turning a blind eye or who were not necessarily aware of how bad the residential schools were are finally starting to see the bodies of the children that were buried like outside of the schools. And, you know, the one thing that Canada, a lot of people in Canada have not started to understand is the the atrocities and the genocide of the residential school system is is horrific but as these schools were being closed and before they knew about all these dead children you know the victims of of these priests and nuns what happened to the priests when those residential schools were closing or while they were still open they just they got were, transferred somewhere else they got transferred somewhere else and they went off somewhere else and they may not have been able to kill and destroy but they were still able to fulfill whatever sadistic or perverted um uh kinks they had throughout this time and they are were allowed and in some cases uh like a father maloney in one diocese could be found as you know being a bit of a problem for that bishop and so he gets transferred to another diocese oh and guess what we're changing his name so now he's you know, uh, Father O'Grady, and there's no paper trail. So you can't trace, it's all hidden and kept secret where these priests went, how they were traveling around, their name changes. I mean, it's a real, like the the diocese, the, the, the archives at the Vatican. I mean, I think there's, you know, many, many lawyers have tried to get access to see and to find out what they've got but of course they're not opening those you know and and for good reason i guess because they've been protecting and basically trafficking child molesters and pedophiles and murderers from diocese to diocese well they can't they can't bring it out into the in their opinion i think they can't bring it out into the light because then it would damage the brand (laughs) for, <laughs> which uh, is my, damaged enough already <laughs> i know it's and uh it, they didn't want to damage it even worse but they what they ended up doing was transferring people so that they can continue the abuse that they were doing to other kids and that's just unconscionable well and they weren't they weren't punishing them no you know um there's a great book by a a, a vatican uh lawyer named tom doyle thomas doyle and when i was writing my initial paper about abuse and recovery (laughs) one of the things that he wrote about which i found um fascinating there was some canon law and i'll i'm going to be misquoting it here but it's in his book uh sex priests and moral codes i think is the name of the book and he actually um 
found this bit of canon law from the before the Middle Ages, where a child who was prepubis was not considered a human being. Essentially meaning before a child enters puberty, they're not human. You can do whatever you want to them, but the minute they can grow a beard, they suddenly have a soul and therefore you can't do what you would do with them. So it almost was a, a law that promoted uh, pedophilia. Well, and the same thing, if you can't get married, um, you know, then, they, then you, a lot of, a lot of uh, hidden homosexuals were there and a lot of a lot of pedophiles now those are two different categories i want to make yeah. everybody clear uh, that a homosexual is not necessarily a pedophile but a pedophile is a destructive human being to other kids i wanted to bring this up to you nicholas because this is cnn eight hours ago catholic diocese in new jersey reaches 87.5 million dollar settlement with hundreds of sexual subu- abuse survivors wow Wow. And that happened to that just that just is on the uh, on just a, on the board or just happened now. Incredible. So, so I'm glad that 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 and I think that's going to open up the floodgates mm-hmm. to a lot of other uh, uh, settlements and things because they now can't hide it anymore. No, oh, it's it, getting harder for them to hide it. And it's really is not it's not working anymore. And, and they're going to have to uh, like the, the folks that were involved with you are going to have to come forward. Are, do you know, are they still alive and are they still around? Uh, I, I think they have actually finally passed um, my in my first go around. Uh, one of my main ab- ab- abusers, who was the principal of the school, uh, was brought up for discovery. <laughs> and so I had to sit in a room with him with for him. two days. Oh. And of course he denied everything. And, you know, he fondly recalled about kicking some children in the schoolyard. Of course he denied everything else. And what was very interesting about that discovery was they were unable to find the transcripts um, when all that information was given to my new lawyer. So the discovery notes were not there. They're probably locked up in the Vatican. Um, But it was... And again, at that time, too, when I was going up to to the small town where this all happened, they were celebrating the arrival of this, you know, this this priest, this brother, and they had all these dinners for him. And at the same time, in the paper at the time, they were just attacking me. And how dare this guy do this against this poor old man? And again, that's one of the reasons I wanted to use my childhood photo. It's because I was not holding accountable an 80-year-old man. It was this five-year-old holding accountable this 40-something-year-old man. And I think, you know, when people start thinking about it like that, like they look at me, yeah, I'm a stunt guy, I'm an actor, I'm, you know, you know, I seem very strong. They tend to forget that, you know, I was once a very small child that needed protection. And I think the photo does that. And the response the second time around with, with that photo, it, it, it brought a lot of people forward, which is fantastic. I think that everybody that, and if you're listening to this now or in the future and you were abused and not even necessarily by a priest, but if you were abused in your childhood, it's got long lasting effects and it will be affecting you in your adult life, whether you want it to or not, whether you recognize it or not, get help. Go talk to somebody and and talk to a therapist and get help so that you can get past it because it affects you, your family, your your co-worker. It it affects your entire sphere of people around you. Do do you agree with that? Oh, I completely agree. I mean, to this day, um, when I go to a restaurant, I have to sit with my back to the wall. I can't have my back exposed behind me. Or if I do, I get very, very uncomfortable. If I go to a movie theater, I like to sit. Um, when I know there's people not behind me, like, so it affects, uh, the small, the things we take for granted or that other people take for granted. Um, the anxiety of being around a lot of strangers, um, my distrust of other males. And here I am as a male, I have very few male friends because I was abused mostly by males. And, and so these are the things that a lot of people just 
we go, oh yeah, I never thought of it like that. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, um, it's it's great that they don't think about it because it means they've they've been able to escape having that done. But anyone who's been abused, you know, um, raped, uh, beaten, or gone through emotional uh, and and psychological abuse, it's it it it's a forever journey to re to continue to function. I I don't think I could ever say heal. I think we're in a constant state of healing. But it's learning how to better function and just to um, to really accept that what happened to us uh, as survivors was not our fault. And that's a huge thing. It took me forever to forgive myself and to allow myself to really accept that what happened to me was not my fault because I had been continually told during the abuse, before and after the abuse was happening, that it was my fault. And they were doing this to cleanse me for God. Oh, brother. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. How, I, I mean, th that just the guilt alone of, of, of going through that. And especially when you're five, because you, you, you don't know you, what you don't know yet. And, and you, you're, that is, you're being told, and that's the gospel. And this is a great big guy, and you're a little guy, and he's got all the power, and you got none. And, and yeah. then he's telling you that God's going to throw you into hell if you don't do what he says. And if you tell your folks that your whole family's going to die, it's what a horrible thing to put on a child. It is. And, and that actually, again, and, and with my relationship as well, um, it does bring up a lot of issues when you are trying to be intimate with your partner. Because there's such the stigma around that and the past and you know the 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 memory of the abuse is not just the event or the events <laughs> excuse me but it's also the smells or the um things that associate with it here's a very weird thing like um i have a really hard time going to the dentist because i cannot stand um anything being in my mouth for too long it's it just re-traumatizes me and you know so when i get pressured to have to go for a checkup it's hard to tell them i am not ready to go in i can't because it just brings back um those events so it's those simple things that we take for granted, like just even a hygiene checkup, like, you know, at the dentist is something I really can't do um, because of what happened. I first, let me say, I, I'm very sorry for what you had to go through and what you went through. It's, it's, it's horrific. Um, and I know you're still working on it. Um, your wife is a lovely lady. Um, you're a great man. I'm glad that you are still friends. And are still working and through stuff and and I, I really wish you really wish you the best and even given all of that <laughs> you've been you're a successful actor writer producer you've got a phd you've got a master's degree you've worked very hard in life you you're you're has anybody told you you're a good guy <laughs> um people have said that and it's it takes a lot to accept it, you know? Um, but yeah, you know, it's, um, again, you know, uh, part of the, after being out of that school, uh, part of my um, whole mission was to keep my head down and bury my face in the books and, and not get, try not to get noticed. So it's, it's a weird thing that now as an actor in, in getting noticed and doing those things. <laughs> But, you know, at the time I just needed to, I wanted to prove that I wasn't, that, that I would like, it's that continual life journey to prove that I'm worthy, to prove that I have a value and it gets tiring. But I think a lot of these things I've done are in some level to prove that I have worth, you know, um, to make up for what happened. And it's really interesting too. Like I had mentioned it, um, like the book, uh, my book, I actually dedicated to my mom because she's the one who uh, there was one day at how I eventually got out of the, the school was um, it was in the springtime. And one of the teachers who was not a priest 
<laughs> she was just a teacher there. She had a electric cord with her kettle. So this is like, you know, the seventies. So they had the big bake light plugs that would go into the wall. And, um, you'd have to line up after recess to get in the class. And the last one in usually got hit with the electrical cord. So it was on the Friday, um, that, and of course I was at this point, I was indulging in, in eating to, uh, gain weight in order to not be attractive to the priests and stuff to try to, and I was eating, you know, uh, for, to kind of, um, ease, the fear and the anxiety that I had. So I was like into junk food quite a bit at the time. So I was short and I was really overweight. And so this teacher, and it happened to me quite a bit, but on this Friday, she went to town on me. I mean, she hit me repeatedly with the electrical cord. And um, on the weekend, it was on a Sunday. And uh, in the small town, we had this thing. I don't know if you've heard of Chinooks, but it was, you know, the winter it was, you know, like just getting into early spring. So it was still cold, but we had this warm weather. So it was actually very, very warm outside. And <laughs> she was putting the laundry on the line outside. And I was wearing long sleeves and, and pants because uh, I didn't want her to see all the welts on my body. And because I didn't want her to ask questions. And she said, you know, put on shorts and a t-shirt. It's warm out. And I was like, oh, I had all these excuses. And, you know, her being a mom, she was like, get on your shirt and short. So it was a battle I wasn't going to win. And I got scared. I went into my room to change. And then I realized that this teacher who had done this to me wasn't a priest or a nun. She was just a teacher there. <laughs> and that So they had never said anything to me about teachers. It was always like just the priests and the nuns, like to, you know, anything can happen, the God would kill my family. They never said anything about a regular teacher. So when I initially came out and my mom saw it, she knew something had happened. Like she saw and she was a mom. Um, and I tried to say that I had fallen. And then she said, you tell me what happened. You tell me. And I finally just realized, oh my gosh, I I'm going to tell her. So I told her what happened. And she immediately pulled me out of that school. The next day she took the day off work and she called the principal who was my main abuser. Uh, and she told him, that he, you know, that she was pulling and she called him, you know, she swore in him and he tried to plead with her to keep me at the school so they could get their grant funding for that year because it got per child funding. And just before that, a few weeks before that, he had thrown me down the stairs uh, and I still have the scar on my chin. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he was trying to break my neck that day. So I'm, I'm very sure that if I had gone back there, he would have killed me. And but anyway, you know, I never set foot in that school again. And uh, I thank my mom for saving my life then. But, um, you know, it wouldn't be for several years that she found out to what extent uh, the abuse was happening. That must have been a horrible moment of recognition for her to find out what actually had gone on with you. Because it sounds like your yeah. mom loved you a great deal and, and wasn't going to put up with any nonsense around you. And then she comes to find out of all the scope that happened. She, the, the guilt that she must have felt must have been. Oh, and to this day, she still feels it. She's still, she's still here. Um, and she blames herself every day. And I tell her, it's not your fault. You didn't know. And she continues as a mom. And I, I get that because as a dad, if I was to find that out, I would be blaming myself all the time. <laughs> my dad, my dad has passed away now, um, but he was a paratrooper in World War II. And he was driving me to those two days of discovery. And he was a very quiet man. He was really funny, really gentle soul. Never told me any of his stories about the war, but you know, he was in the first Canadian parachute battalion, which was a pretty intense group of, of fighters. And on the second day he drove me to discovery, he said, you know, I really wish you had told me back then what had happened. And I said, well, I just couldn't at the time. He says, I understand that. He said, but I would have been out of jail by now. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I just thought about that because he would have, he would have gone down there and he would have dealt with it, you know? Well, and, and I'd like to think that every parent who's taking care of their kids would like to do that, but yeah, you know, uh, 
but it's you know just one of one of those things. So there were there was no winners. There was there was there was there was a lot of guilt and a lot of problems for the entire family, and it's it is multi generational. Yes, yeah, and that's and, one of the things that I feel. You know, before we had children, when I first came out about the abuse to uh, Rebecca at that time, was I have to deal with this because I didn't want to let it become a generational cycle. And and so that was a big factor for me is making sure that I was prepared as, as prepared as I could be to be a parent to make sure that I had dealt with my stuff. You know, a very, very wise idea because it, you're right. It can be generational. It can go from generation to generation. And, and it's, I'm, I'm so glad you did that. I'm so glad you did that. And I'm so glad that we've had the, and we're having this conversation because it is so needed because mm. there are, there are people that were abused that, that still they, they've hit it because they, it's embarrassing. They don't want people to know what happened to them because it's just, you know, it's embarrassing and, they, and, and it's their fault. And, and it's really important that people recognize that when you're five years old, it can't possibly be your fault. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and, but people, and so, and people commit suicide over such things. Yes. Yep. Yes, it's true. I write about my attempts, uh, feeble attempts, thankfully, uh, to unenliven myself. Um, well, that's one of the, that's one of the, the secret. That's one of the few things that I'm glad you aren't very good at. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so yeah. because you've got a lot to, you, you know, the the play. I I've read some reviews on the play. The play was outstanding. The book is outstanding. You're having an impact. Um, you there are people that are not going to suffer abuse because of the, what you are doing, and I applaud you for that. Well, and you know, what's really wonderful too is like, I, I have a, a dear old friend of mine. Um, I should say old friend, a person I've known for a long time. When I went to school in England, I became friends with um, Alan Cumming, who is, he lives in New York now. He's a big celeb celebrated actor and, you know, um, very great guy. Uh, I sent him the manuscript before I published it and he wrote a little blurb. So he's even on the back of my book, you know, having his testimonial uh again so i i'm hoping that all of his fans will get the book because he liked it <laughs> so. absolutely absolutely and it's going to do how is the book doing how long has it been out by the way uh it was it's been out since january and it's been doing okay i mean again it's it's a it's an interesting process when i first um wrote the book or was writing the book i i had a few mainstream publishers who were interested <laughs> and i sent them the manuscript and then they were suddenly like, no 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 we don't <laughs> want to touch this understandably and then i was just going to let it sit and uh, a dear friend of mine um her name is colette berg i was lamenting to her because i'm like well i want to do this book but the only way i'd do it the way i'd want to would be to have to self-publish because that way i would have control over how it looks and how it's done and there's just no way I could afford it. And she, I did not know this at the time, but she was had completed and was a professional editor. And she says, well, you know what? I'll edit your book for you. And I was like, uh, okay, I can't pay you. And she says, no, no, no. I want to do this. I've seen your play. Your story needs to be told. So she did it all for free. And I, for months, we were back and forth. And there's chapters in this book that are in there only because as she read it, she said, I need something here that needs to connect this and this. And so I would write a chapter over a weekend and send it to her. And some of the people that have read the book, those chapters that were added on her recommendation are people's favorite chapters in the book. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So she really helped flesh it out. And then there was uh, Pia Guerra, who you may or may not know of. Uh, Pia is probably most well known for the show that just uh, was on FX called Why the Last Man or Why Last Man. She was the creator of that show. She was She's a graphic artist. And she and her husband, Ian Boothby, saw my show. And I put it on Facebook that I was looking for someone who might know anyone who could do a cover for me. And Pia just messaged me and said, no, 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 I'm doing your cover. And I'm like, Pia, I can't afford you. And she says, no. 
your story needs to be told. And the, even the title safe space, I, I said to her and Ian, and Ian and I used to play theater sports together. We were improvisers together. And I said, you know, how Star Wars saved my life is just such a chunky title. It's just, it's just so bulky. And then I said, I need a catchy title. And Ian was like, safe space. I'm like, of course, that's it. Perfect. So it was very interesting how all these different people came together to make the book happen. And one of my former instructors, uh, Dr. Ernest Mateus at UBC, him and I would talk about fandom. He's written many books about um, the cult of fandom and cult cinema. And I gave him the manuscript to read. And he said, you know, I'm going to write you an introduction. So there's an introduction in the book written by him. And it's, it's to contextualize what the reader is about to read through, you know, an academic's lens and, and why this story is important and the importance of, of how fandom is actually so transformative. And then the other thing about the book, which is interesting, is Colette was telling me that uh, we were talking about asterisms. I don't know if you know what an asterism is, but there are um, these little, three little dots that kind of yes. separate text. So she said, you know, you need something there to kind of keep up with the theme. And she said, you know, your daughter, Olivia, is an artist, so she should draw little droids. And, and I said, well, she, Olivia doesn't like to do things for people. I asked Olivia, Olivia drew them. So the great thing is, uh, you probably can't see it there, but there's these little droids that come oh, that's up. that's cute. And those are actually, my daughter drew those. So she's credited in the book as well. So all these people came together to create so i feel that this book really is a community effort it's it's my story but it's also the story that is told with the help of my community and giving me as a survivor the support and the strength to have a really powerful book and their contribution just makes it even that much better and much stronger and that's 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 how i was going to take it is that mm. these people read the transcript they understand or the manuscript. They understand what you went through. They support you. They care about you. And they want to do everything that they can to get the word out and to support you in this. And that that really is that really is the moral of the story. Mm. Is that you suffered this horrible abuse, but you've got some great people around you that care and they really want the best for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, and I'm really starting to accept that. It takes time, but I'm it's starting to, to accept do. it. It is. It's hard to do. And a good friend of mine says uh, <laughs> she had the same problem with accepting compliments, and she's now saying, okay, I receive this. It's okay. Mm -hmm. I am good. I am worth it. And uh, it's it's okay. And um, and that's, you know, that's, that's a place that we all have to go at one point or another. Um, mm -hmm. Because, you know, we're, we can all do well and we're all good people. And, you know, um, uh, Nicholas, can I have you back? Because we need more. I want to talk about your acting career. I want to talk about fencing and, and, yes. and stunt doubles and all that kind of stuff. The, the, the things that you've done. Um, uh, I've got some juicy Steven Seagal stories for you, too. So. Oh, I would love to hear that. <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. So can, can, can you come back and we do this again? I would be more than happy to come back and speak with you. Awesome. That would, that would, that would be terrific. So I'm, unfortunately I have to go, but I want to give you the opportunity to say anything that you'd like to, to our audience about anything at all. Um, what I'd love to just say is to anyone out there who is a survivor or is a victim or is, is a family member with a survivor is just listen to the children. And, you know, it's just about, hearing the stories without judgment is the most important thing and letting us just be be well be happy be loved but you you are all of those things and and um uh, nicholas i really wish you well and i uh, and i'm looking forward to the next time that we have an opportunity to talk thank you kevin and may the force be with you <laughs> uh, <laughs> Live long and prosper. <laughs> <laughs> and may yes. the force be with you too. Uh, I Thank just you. love that metaphor. It's 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 a great it, it's a, it's a it's a great thing and and the energy that surrounds us, we have the opportunity to use it and uh, it can become a great thing for us all. I agree.
So uh, we've been talking with Nicholas Harrison. Go to his website, which is nicholasjharrison.com. Go get the book, Safe Space, a true story of faith, betrayal, and the power of the force. A, a wonderful, a wonderful, a wonderful title. I love the uh, uh, lightsaber that you have on the very front. Oh, uh, and- that's actually a shinai. That's uh, part of my kendo. Oh, um, very nice. Yes, and you can get the book not only on my website. You can also find it on Amazon. You can find it at Barnes and Noble, Chapters Indigo, anywhere where they sell books online. You can find the book. And if they don't have it, they'll order it. They will. And that's 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 just awesome. So if you'll stay right there, I will be right back. Thanks for enjoying this episode all the way to the end. Please give us a like and subscribe to this channel. This has been a production of kmmedia.pro. Please visit our website, oddly enough, named kmmedia.pro for more details about us and our mission, which is to provide great positive programming designed to inspire us all. I'm Kevin McDonald, and I'm proud of these shows, and I truly hope that you'll like them and share them with friends and family. So on behalf of our entire team, remember, be kind to each other because 